Well, thank you, Stephen, uh, for that introduction. I echo Stephen's sentiments in seeing a, a good crowd here today. It's a warm day, uh, and we've got a fair bit to get through, so I'll try to be concise. We've got a number of bases to touch, so that I hope we can give you a full explanation of where we've come from September last year. The initial contact was in September 2015, when a letter was sent to the President of the Australian National Pigeon Association, which is, in other words, the fancy pigeon people. I'll read a couple of paragraphs as they appeared in that letter. AHA, Animal Health Australia, is commissioned to facilitate development of nationally consistent standards and guidelines for livestock to streamline welfare legislation in Australia. Further, I require a national representative for show, racing and meat pigeons to be part of the process. The nominee will participate in the stakeholder advisory group. I'll get to some of these terms a bit, a bit later on. So you can see from the thrust in that letter, it wasn't a case of invitation, pop along if you like. You've got to be there. They were directives, not invitations. So what quickly followed from there was the president of the Fancy Pigeons uh, discussed the matter with his board. Um, one of the people involved was Chris Schutz, who many of you know. Chris is based in Adelaide. The fancy people quickly resolved that uh, they had a lot less fanciers involved than we did. Uh, and also the pigeons, they identified it themselves, that pigeons posed a greater welfare risk to their participants than caged show pigeons. For that reason, they were prepared to put a nominee forward, but they are quite happy for racing pigeons to act on their behalf. Chris Schutz spoke to Stephen Nusky, who at that time was a member of the SAHPA five-man committee, sought his advice on which way that they should go. Stephen Nusky got in touch with me, and uh, given I was Canberra-based, and the meetings have either been hookups, but uh, mainly uh, meetings Northbourne Avenue in Canberra, two lots of two-day meetings. Uh, Stephen said, would you be available to do this, and would you be prepared to do this? I said in principle, yes, I would do, but um, I wasn't quite sure of the nuts and bolts, and I would go to Animal Health Australia and meet with them to make sure that I was cognizant of all of the facts. Who are AHA? They are established by the Australian, Territory and State Governments, plus major national stakeholders in the livestock industry. They're funded by those people. They're funded 33% by the federal government. Now, they're not a government department, but they are very strongly centred around government, and they have got clout. I met with AHA staff, and I found them very open and helpful. Um, one of them, the senior project officer, has been more than helpful throughout this whole process because I've never been to a government meeting, meeting let alone a government welfare meeting and it is something different, let me tell you. Uh, the people were very helpful and sympathetic with our cause. When I was there, the AHA asked for a code of practice. Uh, we abide by currently, and I was able to give them a South Australian code of practice. Now, the South Australian code of practice mirrors largely Western Australia. Western Australia is a registered document, so it's something that we as pigeon fanciers abide by this current time. Their background in pigeons was just about new. And that's not a criticism because I was on a committee of 33 people and some of the judgments that I was asked about were on quail, geese, ostrich and emu. Now what I know about those, you could write on NASPRO, and it's very similar with these people uh, at board level there. They're not pigeon based. One of the questions I asked when I was there, just to try and suss out how heavy was this, who gave the directive for this process? Well, an answer came back very quickly. The Federal Minister for Agriculture, Barnaby Joyce. So you couldn't start any higher. 
He then refers to the Animal Welfare Task Group, which is a government department. So that the lasso is put around all of the country, Animal Welfare Task Group goes to the State Minister's Ministers for Agriculture. Everyone now is in the loop. Everyone's involved, everyone's committed to be a part of the process. And it then handled on for Animal Health Australia to coordinate. Animal Health Australia don't make the rules. They've been directed to run this process. A couple of clear messages. Um, as at this stage, I hadn't committed myself to do it, but as each quarter of an hour drew by, I knew that we had to be a part of this process. In negative terms, if we hadn't done it, we would have shot ourselves in the foot. We needed to have somebody there to help self-regulate the sport. Additionally, I actually stressed that the person that was going to represent pigeons would be a member of a 33-person committee, the Stakeholder Advisory Group. And that person had to be empowered to speak on behalf of the Australian pigeon fraternity. When you go to the meetings, it's a process of negotiation and discussion. You can't put up your hand and say, look, I'll be back in a quarter of an hour or I'll speak to Steve and we'll get back to you. You have to be empowered to make those decisions at that time. I said that a national board would have to be formed to give the power to this representative for the pigeon fraternity. They said, that's fine. Uh, why is to do that? Because you are talking about a national code of practice. But bear in mind that this is early October, that early January we will be in touch with you with suggestions for standards and guidelines that must be adhered to and we need a decision making person at that time. So from a letter late September we were required to have somebody representing the sport in January. About three months, not very long. The flow on from here, um, I took this back to Stephen Nusty and confirmed that I would assist and it had to be done. But only if a national board was formed, as we had to put in place nationally consistent standards. There's two things here. It had to be national, it had to be Australia wide, it had to be cooperative, we had to work together. But I certainly was to go to meetings and uh, put my you-know-what on the line uh, because I wasn't empowered to do so. It was easy. The, the choices were be responsible, do nothing, don't nominate a nominee and leave it in the hands of non pigeon people. And that could have been quite dangerous. The other option, be responsible and meet the challenge in the best interests of the sport. Realistically, there was only one choice if we wanted to self-regulate. We had to be part of this process. The next trip was structuring the board. Clearly time is of the essence. We were in October, board, representative, confirmed by early January. <coughs> Several people, uh, one of them, Stephen Nusky, uh, burnt the midnight oil to contact senior administrators throughout the country uh, to seek their advice, to seek their suggestion. Who would be a capable person from your state, territory, <coughs> to make decisions, to be involved with the code of practice, Australia-wide. Now, that took a number of phone calls. We then had to make approaches to those people. Do you, would you like to participate? Can you have, give us a time? And we then got confirmation of people from various states. Mark Jeffrey, Greg Koski. I won't, I won't go through it through more, but uh, we then, have the people having committed themselves to do this job, we had to go back to the boards, or sorry, the, the administrations for the states and territories and have those people confirmed. 
During this period, Charles Harder, who many in this room may know, Charles Harder is a fitted player and he's the honorary secretary for the VHA. And he's been uh, terrific in his support. He's advised us on the formation of the board, uh, the incorporation, the constitution. He's been ready for phone contact uh, and he's been a wonderful support. This was very hastily done. Um, but there was no other way of doing it. The members of this Australian National Board are the states and territories. We had to contact the states and territories to give their approval, to give their endorsement of the guy who was going to re represent their state at board level. It was hastily done, but we didn't have any option but to do so. I mentioned before about the Stakeholder Advisory Group. I was one of 33 people on this advisory group. It's mainly poultry based and it shouldn't be any surprise to anybody. Uh, they've got a billion dollar industry and they did have a significant number of uh, nominees on the board. Uh, there are other species uh, like geese, ostrich, emu, quail, pigeons. All of these people had a representative of the board. Also on the board, um, and this is where some of the debates got interesting, were people from RSPCA, Department of Primary Industry, Agriculture and Animal Welfare. We met for two days in March and two days in August. And I can assure you, and we'll discuss this later, the three prominently, most prominently discussed subjects there were welfare, welfare and welfare. The Stanford guidelines, and I'll explain in a moment, they were finalised for all species at the August meeting. There's no trick with standards and guidelines, it's very simple. Standards and guidelines were promoted by Animal Health Australia because they replaced the code of practice that had been put in place the last time, 2002. They served the same process as a code of practice but they're broken into two parts. Quite simply, standards, they're must-do's. No option with standards. We have five of them. They're very glad. There won't be any difficulty for sensible pictured people to uphold these. It won't mean any change to the way you go about things. Well, I hope it won't change. It's basic. A must-do. So you we equate it to the road. You must stop at a red traffic light. It's not negotiable. You must do that. The same with our standards. The guidelines, there are 18 of them. They're basically recommendations. Again, in a road sense. Uh, in common sense, if you're driving on the road and it's thumping down with rain, the road's greasy, slippery, it's a suggestion that you drive more slowly. Uh, you're not compelled to, but it makes sense to do so. The same with the recommendations. They're saying, we're not continuing to do these things, but we think it's in your best interest to do it. The standards and guidelines, as I said, the 5 and the 18, they form part of the National Code of Practice. And those standards and guidelines will be available for public consultation in February of 2017. Um, and that'll be for poultry, the whole lot. Um, it is not the expectation of Animal Health Australia that we'll have any inquiry. If there is substantiated change, they will make it. But it's unlikely that our standards and guidelines will change. The red green folder there on the desk, there's uh, copies of the standard and guidelines, double page. There's a copy there for everybody. Um, if you would like to take it and read it when you've got the opportunity, uh, you can ask questions at question time. If you miss the opportunity there, don't hesitate to ask me a question. I'm only too happy to answer them for you. Be our agents and take these standards and guidelines with you. Take them back to your clubs, take them back to your federations and your members so they can have a look at them. There's no secret with this. I, I would suggest shortly, Andrew, would we have something on our website? Very shortly. People can just tap and read. Okay. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they will be an appendix to our code of practice. In a nutshell, we had 
to be involved in this process. The standards and guidelines have to be nationally consistent. Therefore, the formation of a national body is a necessity. The national body was formed very quickly, but it was formed correctly. Thank you for your attention.